Welcome back, everybody, to We Are TPM with myself, Kyle Teixeira, sitting across from me, John Teixeira, and today we have a special guest with us. Patrick Noonan. Patrick Noonan, that is correct. So this week we are going to dive deeper into uh, a section of last week's topic. Uh, last week we went into ways to uh, avoid and, and get around or, and transfer capital, your capital gains, capital gains, yeah. capital gains tax. Um, this week we're going to talk about 1031 exchanges, which we briefly brushed over, and now we're going to do a deep dive with uh, Patrick into that today. Yeah. So if uh, there's anything you guys hear on this today that you want to talk to us about, give us a call, 817-818-9039. Shoot us an email, show me the money at we are TPM. Now let's get into it. Yeah, a proper introduction for Patrick. First of all, Patrick, thank you for joining us. I want, I want to find out more about your Definitely. company, but... Um, you know, I used to refer, uh, we do 10, we refer 1031 exchanges to our investors. I got a guy in New York that we used to refer, and I ran across Patrick, um, I don't know, it was about a year ago or so, you and I started communicating by email, and man, it's really nice to have somebody here locally that we can send somebody to, because people like, they like to know that they've, they've got somebody on their team that's, that's local, right, Patrick? That's right. Um, you know, it's funny, a lot of folks still like to, to sit down and meet face to face, you know, the old fashioned way. And it's, it's good to have a local connection that actually can work nationally. So even though I'm located in Texas, I do transactions routinely all over the country, uh, especially with the way the market's moving right now, where there's a lot of relocation going on because of, you know, the people's realization that they can really work from anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and the 1031 is has benefited from that a great deal. You know, uh, folks that have, you know, been, st- uh, you know, basically stationary in one, one area for a long time have realized, you know, they can move out to the country, they can move to different parts of the country and still be efficient in getting their job done. And uh, with that goes, uh, often they've got investment properties that they're going to sell and re- relocate as well. Um, obviously, Texas is a very hot market. So, um, when uh, brokers and CPAs and attorneys are talking to their customers hmm. and those customers are planning a move, they'll often mention or bring mm-hmm. up 1031 exchanges so that they could perhaps, um, let's say you've got property in California or New York or Chicago or Florida, and you're moving to Texas and you'd like to you know, kind of bring those properties along with you just for the ease of, of um, you know, being a landlord or, or, or uh, property manager, um, or you're looking to get better returns on your investment, you know, uh, you know, with California, um, you know, you're not going to see the same cash flow that you see on, on investment properties in, in Texas, especially right now. Um, and nor are you seeing the gains, the, cap, the, the, the appreciation that we're experiencing here in Texas and, hmm. and have been now for, for quite some time. It's been, you know, three to five years of double digit appreciation in, in most of the counties in Texas. Yeah, definitely. And just because you talked about moving, Patrick, uh, I just want to specify this product is is primarily used for, for investment property, correct? Yeah, that's right. But when people move, they also tend to have, the, they move their, if they've got investment properties that where they're coming from, they're going to move it to where they live. Um, yeah, they bring their know, portfolio uh, with them, essentially. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, you know, but the, the types of people that are exchanging are really broad. Okay, so you've mm-hmm. got folks that are, um, you know, may have rent houses or land someplace and they're moving to, uh, you know, Texas to, to buy, you know, maybe they're going to buy rent houses or multifamily or retail office. All, all of the investment property types are um, exchangeable with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's often misconstrued that the, the like kind definition is very specific, whereas it's not. I mean, you, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm selling my manufacturing building, so I have to go buy another manufacturing building. In fact, they could buy from any of the other categories, including royalty interest in gas and oil or mineral rights, and uh, and often do. You know, um, it's a it's a it's a market driven thing, just like anybody else or anything else. So, um, you know, we'll have seasons where it's multifamily all day, every day, and sometimes it's office buildings. And uh, right now, we've seen a big, big increase in people buying um, land um, and, mm. and holding it for appreciation. Mm. 
So in order for a property to be eligible for 1031, it really has to be held for investment or productive use in a trade or business. So not a primary residence or second home, but um, if you're if you're buying any other property and, you're, and it's not a personal use property, you're gonna rent it, you're just gonna hold it for appreciation. Those properties are all eligible for 1031 treatment, provided they you know, adhere to some you know, fairly simple rules. So Patrick, I try to, sometimes I try to get into the psyche of somebody that might be listening to us that doesn't have any idea what a 1031 exchange is, right? They've heard about it for the first time, maybe from us or somebody else, but they really don't know what it is. Give us a really simple definition for that layman term of what a 1031 exchange is and why they would use it. Absolutely. So basically the boiled down to its the simplest fact is you're deferring the capital gain tax that you would normally pay when you sell investment property. And you do that through section one or 1031 of the tax code. And basically what it allows for is you, if you're reinvesting in more investment property of equal or greater value, using all your cash towards the purchase of the new property, the proceeds from your sale, and replacing any debt you had on the property you sold with equal or greater, you can achieve 100% tax deferral. And you know why would you want to do that? Well, in most cases, people would rather have their money work for them than just go to the IRS, mm -hmm. right? If, if, you're, if you're paying those capital gain taxes, it's really not doing you its service. That's right. But as, a, as an investor in real estate, especially if you're starting out young, you're going to ideally continue to reinvest in new real estate and defer taxes through 1031. And that multiplier effect will work for you where you've got that equity that's achieving, uh, you know, appreciation. You've got, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that you're possibly making more income on reinvesting in more, pre you know, preferable properties. Um, so those are the kinds of reasons why people exchange. But really, when it boils right down to it, you're deferring the tax that you would normally pay when you sell investment property. And that can be uh, for capital gain tax for the sale of, a, of an investment property. It starts at 15% on the gain, which is what you make over what you bought it for. And, and basically, if you're starting out fresh, it's it's actually over your adjusted basis in the property, which is uh, I'll go down to that. That's kind of a rabbit hole, but <laughs> I'm yeah. short of that because you're going to defer 15 to 20 percent on the on the realized gain, which is what you're making on the property, and you're also deferring the depreciation tax recapture that you would normally pay. So most folks, when they buy an investment mm -hmm. property, part of the reason they're going to do it is because they want to take depreciation to offset their ordinary income. Right. And yeah. when they do that, that's great, but that, that the IRS doesn't it. get, they're going to try and collect that when you sell the property, and unless you do a 1031 exchange. And that 25%, they call it depreciation recapture tax, mm -hmm. is also deferred. So, for example, if I sell, let's say I've got an um, RV park or a warehouse, and I'm going to sell it for a million dollars. And I, you know, I bought it for 500000 two years ago. Um, so I'm going to be taxed on that entire 500,000, uh, at 15 to, you know, 20% for wealthy tax taxpayers, there's an additional 3.8%. So that's just on the gain. And then the depreciation that I've taken over the last two years is going to be taxed at 25%. Hmm. So it, it adds up quickly. And especially if you're in states where they also collect capital gain tax. So you're, You've got your 25%, you've got your 20, you know, your 23 and yeah. three eighths, or yeah. 20, 23, yeah, three eighths. And then you've got um, state capital gain tax as well. So in California, they collect an additional 13.1%. So now you're looking at, you know, you're, it's eating up your your, your profit pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Just so the 1031 exchange um, handles, it, it, it goes along with that. The state tax also it kind of defers that as well. It defers, yes, it defers state tax as well. There's some states that don't recognize 1031 exchange, the, the, uh, Pennsylvania being one and Puerto Rico being another. You can't exchange in or out of Puerto Rico. 
you can exchange all over the country freely. So sell property in Texas and buy in, you know, Florida, New York, Chicago. Uh, you know, you can buy in the Northern Mariana Islands or, um, the, you know, the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands or Guam. The only place that gets ripped off, again, is Puerto Rico for some reason. <laughs> they don't allow 1031 in and out. So in... in- to, to make this, I guess, even a more simple example, this is essentially a way to let these unrealized gains in a property be transferred to another property and remain unrealized, essentially, um, so that they're not taxed. It, it very, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, because you're going to respend, so if I'm going to restate what you said a little bit, Patrick, you're going to take the money that you gained at the closing table and you're going to respend it and, and reinvest it into new investment property. So it's not really going into your account. It's transferring from one account to a, to one property to another, right? So let's say yeah, I've got so $100,000 $100, left over. What happens with that? So, yeah. In order to achieve 100% tax deferral, you've got to do three things. Buy equal to or greater than what you sell for. Use all the cash towards the new purchases of investment property and replace any debt. Now, people often don't do all three of those things. But you are, and it's and it still may be a viable exchange. You'll have what we call a partial exchange. So in your example, if let's say, you know, you sell for 500,000 and you end up buying for 400,000 and you have $100,000 of cash left over, you're simply taxed on that $100,000 of tax uh, of cash that you receive. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, you know, when I'm talking to folks, I'm always trying to get to the to the, the basics of how much, you know, how much are you looking to do? Are, mm-hmm. are you looking to reinvest first of all? What's your tax liability? Do you want to invest equal to what you sold for? Um, and if those answers are all yes, then it's a no brainer, right? Go forward and, and defer. Um, but it could still be a no brainer if you're taking some cash out or buying for less, you just, you don't want to take so much out or buy for so much less that your tax liability essentially is the same. Hmm. Okay. Well, let me ask you this question, Patrick, uh, yeah, what, let's talk limits, you know, so I, everybody was trying to, you know, bypass the tax code or think they you can know, outsmart the IRS. I, why don't I just defer this, sell it, put it in, put it in exchange, and I'm not going to buy my next investment property for three, four years. You know, would they let me do that? I already know the answer. but No, I'm... there are time frames <laughs> on the 1031, unfortunately. Gotcha. Uh, there's a lot of rules that, that can make a, an exchange challenging. And I'd say the first and, and foremost of those are the time limits. So with every exchange, it's got, think of it as having a lifespan of 180 calendar days. And that begins on the day, in most cases, where you're selling or closing on the sale of your property. And the first 45 days of that is your identification period, which is also very challenging right now because of the way the market mm-hmm. is moving. Um, you know, if you are trying to um, identify a property that you want to purchase within that first 45 days, um, it can be challenging right now because properties are selling so quickly. So that's one of the bigger bigger challenges my, my customers are having. So I, my advice to them is to be pretty aggressive about going out and getting under contract on properties. Um, you know, it's not a requirement to identify a property to be under contract. But right now it's a really good idea because that first 45 days, you know, you've got to submit your identification. And let's say you submit um, uh, an identification of three properties. Well, um, in order for your exchange to continue, you're going to have to close on one of those three or all of those three or some of those three in order to get a deferral. Um, And, you know, if you find out after for any reason, you can't close on the properties you identify. Basically, you're going to have to pay the taxes as if you had not attempted to do an exchange. Hmm. Interesting. So you have you have 45 days to identify the properties, and then those have to be the ones you end up closing. So you know you have to your plan has to be set within that first 45 days, and it can't change after that. Am I hearing that right? That's exactly right. So by midnight on day 45, you're you're committed to what you've identified, and those are the properties you can buy. So, so um, oh, I'm sorry. If, if I get it, if I lucky, if I get lucky enough, and I'm, and I talk to folks before they're 
closing day or you know you know a month or two ahead that they're planning ahead and they're investigating 1031 my advice is go out and try to find a property now get under contract if you can and if you can stipulate that you're going to close after you close on your sale then you're you're in much better shape than the guy that's you know calling me the night before he's closing on his you know, sales saying I want to do a 1031 and doesn't realize these rules are in place. That's interesting. Uh, so, because then they only have that 45 days to try to find properties and, that are viable to close on. Huh. That's really interesting because usually the purchaser of your your investment property is an investor as well, right? And they may understand the 1031 exchange timelines as well. So that might be, that would be an easy uh easy request of a buyer to put off closing maybe for a few days, a week or two, whatever, until you are able to get through that, get, get it, something it, under contract. In normal markets, it's not say. unreasonable, but this market is bananas. Yeah. I mean, I am talking, people have been in a frenzy. I'm not kidding for the last two years, mm. properties are selling as soon as they're put on the market. And this isn't just in one category. It's in the residential yeah commercial multifamily uh, anything in that strict of a timeline in these market conditions is i'm sure surely exactly. hard so oh, let me ask you can you re-identify within that 45 day period so say i close sure. you can yeah so you can you can amend your identification as many times as you need to up to midnight on, on day 45 um but once that day midnight passes it's over um so you know, and I always like to try to get people to identify at least a couple of days before midnight on day 45, because there's actually a way you could you could fail your exchange by simply over identifying property. Hmm. Um, huh. And so I like to be able to talk to them and review the properties that they're, you know, they're identifying um, and make sure that the math works because, you know, there's a lot of rules within, within 31. There's rules within rules. Um, <laughs> And just in the identification rules, there's there's three. And the first one is the three property rule. And it says you can identify up to three properties and they could have any combined value. So you'd sell for, let's say, let's say you sell for $100,000 and you go out and you identify three properties and their combined value could be 100,000, a million, a billion, a trillion, it doesn't matter. But once you identify more than three properties, you're subject to a cap of 200% or twice the, the, uh, the sales price of your relinquished property, the property you sold. So same example, you sell for you know, 100,000 and you go out and you identify five or six or 10 or 20 properties, well, it could be okay as long as the combined value is not more than 200,000. Hmm. And you can see how that could be a challenge. Okay, so on the other side of that, is there is there limits on how much uh, capital gains you can defer. So say I have, you know, two million. You know, it's a big property. Or something. I'm I'm trying to exchange two million worth of equity into other investments. Is there any thresholds on that? No, I you know I do transactions anywhere from you know a fifty thousand dollar rent house to a couple of billion dollars in you know office buildings or wait somebody's got a fifty thousand dollar rent house. <laughs> What's that? I said, wait a minute. Somebody's got a fifty thousand dollar rent house. Yeah, there's actually they're they're, they're they're surprisingly they're out there still. Now they might not be where you want to buy. Are they like but, in Alaska uh, or something, out in the middle of the the <laughs> snow or something, or like an igloo? Is that what that is? <laughs> so yeah, so so like the you know the same you know, goes for the you know the uh, you know five hundred million dollar manufacturing plant. You're selling that, you're going to, you can, there's no cap. I've got a company that does um, sit down restaurants like Red Robin and um, uh, hmm. Buffalo Wild Wings. And they may, you know, they probably own two or 3,000 of those restaurants. And every time that they sell one, they're going to exchange it into another. Uh, so this, this company not only has, you know, a large amount of tax being deferred, but They'll have multiple exchanges going on at a time, maybe three or four hundred a year. Um, so there, there, there's no limitation on how many you do, or when you do them. Um, so, and no cap on how much tax you can defer. Well, and I'm going to keep playing devil's advocate here, Patrick, if you don't mind, because I got a. Yeah. Uh, and you partially answered this, but I'm going to get a little specific. So, say I wanted to exchange, you know 
I pick identify one property and then I wanted to exchange to you know a stock investment, but more specifically a REIT because you know that's that kind of falls under the property category. So is that is that something that's allowed? Is there ways that that can be done? Well, it's, that's a great question and very good devil's advocate question. <laughs> so you can exchange almost any real property for any other but you have to exchange a real property right. So you can't gotcha. exchange shares or partnership interest with 1031 exchange. Interesting. So REITs actually sell you shares in the REIT, right? The Real Estate mm -hmm. Investment Trust. Yeah. Now, there are products that are similar to a REIT that are set up specifically for 1031 customers. And the way they're structured, it's, it's well, let me tell you what they are. They're, they're Delaware Statutory Trusts. A Delaware Statutory Trust, or DST, uh, is designed for 1031 uh, people that want to reinvest in property, uh, but maybe they don't want to be a property manager. Maybe they don't want to you know, have to be liable for anything that happens on their property or collect rents or any of that. So DST might contain a couple of Walgreens or student housing in Austin or uh, a Home Depot in Des Moines. Uh, there, there's a lot of different off-the-shelf kind of products that are that are available, and the D, the DST providers allow the 1031 customers to actually buy a fractional interest in the offering as a tenant in common with other investors, hmm. and therefore they're not buying shares, they're not buying partnership interest. They do get to invest in more institutional grade real estate. Um, but they uh, don't have the, the kind of the hassle of, of owning and, and managing a property. The other appealing thing for that is if um, you've got exchangers that um, are, are leveraged highly on their on their property, there's a debt component built in. So let's say I'm selling my property for I don't know, use hundred thousand dollars, and I have um, an eighty thousand dollar loan. On and I want to sell it and reinvest, and I want to do a 1031 exchange, but I don't want to go out and get another loan. Maybe my credit got torn up or something happened. Um, and I don't want to be a property manager anymore. I'm just, I just want to go someplace that I, I can get some passive income and I'll be happy with that. So you buy into this DST, and it's got the part, you know, you're going to use all your 20% of cash you receive, and then it'll have a debt component for the 80% that you need to get to 100% tax deferral. So it's pretty neat in that regard, and it, and it works for people that are, you know, getting close to retirement age that are interested in not being property managers anymore. It's also a good way to save an exchange. So in this market where you're not entirely 100% sure you're going to be able to close on what you identify, one of the properties you might want to identify is a DST interest equal to the sales price of the property you're selling. So if the other properties fall through, you can close on that DST. Hmm. Or you can also identify a delta, let's say I sell for 100000 and I want to go buy an $80,000 property. Now I've got this $20,000 left over. I can put that into a DST to make the exchange 100%. Well, you know, Kyle, we've talked about a whole bunch of technical stuff, and you know how my, I kind of gloss over when we get technical, right? That's why I hire people like Patrick to, to get this <laughs> stuff done. So let's let's talk about Yeah, and I'm so geeky, I forget when I'm getting technical. So you guys no, just snap it, your fingers or something when, I'm, when your eyes are glazing. You're up. doing fine, Patrick. Kyle is absorbing it and loving this. He's 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 <laughs> just like you are. So, so, so I want to talk about real quick the type of person that might use this as somebody that's maybe changing markets. Maybe they're taking advantage of the current situation and the current market that they're in somewhere because they want to maybe sell their home in California and buy two of them in in Dallas or Fort Worth area, right? Or it could be anywhere. Um, that's kind of the ideal scenario that, that you're probably seeing, right, Patrick? That's mostly who's doing this, get out yeah, of one market see, to get into another? We see a lot of that, a lot of reload, but also um, there's, there's, there's some reasons – that you know, I don't. I can't call them reasons to exchange, but there are things that a company, you know, the reason is you want to get the tax deferral, but there there are other benefits that will coincide with your your exchange. Um, the first one, like you said, changing markets. Right, I'm going to get out of California. I'm going to go someplace where I can make more cash, and I'll have less tax. 
and it's an easier lifestyle. Um, the other would be estate planning. I get this a lot. I do I do a lot of farm and ranch. I kind of positioned hmm. myself that, uh, in that market about three years ago, hmm. kind of seeing what was going to happen with land. And it's going. It's, I, can't, I should have bet on myself because it's really turned out to be a remarkable thing. Hmm. Um, people are investing in land and farms and ranches all over, hmm. and it is uh, the farmers and ranchers are seeing, you know. Uh, you know, what they're selling their property for is more than they ever imagined mm-hmm. they would earn, you know, ever, right? So mm-hmm. a guy's selling his, you know, 500-acre ranch for $20 million, and he's like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? You know, I, I don't want to pay the taxes on $20 million, so maybe I'll go buy five smaller ranch farms, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll diversify in that regard so that I get my tax deferral, but I'm also doing it because I'm going to will each of my five kids a ranch. Hmm. And when those kids inherit a ranch at 5 million, they're going to get what's called a step up in the tax basis of the property, the fair market value of the property at the time I ranch or die, right? Which is a great gift to give to your kids uh, because that step up in basis means that if they were to turn around and sell their ranch um, shortly after inheriting it without any you know appreciable gain happening, um, they would have no tax liability. Right. right. So that's a super great gift to give to yeah, somebody. Yeah. Because um, because your cost ba- their cost basis is based on the value at the time of inheritance, not at the time of you purchasing it. Maybe right. twenty years before that. Correct. We talked about that. Last exactly. Week. Yep. Yeah. Now, conversely, let's say you've got a very generous rancher and he's got kids and he decides he's going to give them all uh, a five million dollar ranch. Well, he's giving them the ranch, but he's also giving them the tax liability uh, that he has. So it's, if he did the right thing and just passed away and then gave it to the kids, that would be a better thing for everybody. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know. A lot of people like to give that property away before they die. Well, that's very interesting, Patrick. So let me ask you one more time on limits, because you you jumped on one that that you know I was thinking is probably the primary focus of it is diversification. But is there thresholds for how often you can do this, or how often you can do it with an identified property? So, for example, I'm exchanging one for three, and then a year later, maybe I want to exchange each one of those three for another three, you know, um, and, and yeah, no, there's, no, there's no limit on them. In yeah. fact, you can, another reason that people exchange is like I said, go back to diversification, sell one by three, also consolidation. Maybe somebody's got, I mean, I, I'm not kidding. You. A lot of guy calls me and says, mm. man, I've got 500 red houses. Hmm. I am crazy trying to manage these things. Um, buy an apartment company. Can I exchange into one property? Yeah. And the answer to that is yeah. So you can consolidate too. You can hmm. sell um, twenty rent houses and go buy a multifamily building for a piece Love of it. land. Piece of land. Well, one more, um, so, one more on that, Patrick, because this this one, yeah, I, this Patrick, one. tell him he's capped out on questions. Okay? <laughs> no, this is a good one. So I got three rent properties. You know, I want to I want to exchange all of them into a mansion I want to go live in. So into a primary residence now. Will that work for the tax deferral? Because now it's under a private residence and we're under whole different capital gains rules. Is that okay? So remember the beginning. I said you can't exchange primary residence. Okay, but you must be reading my mind because this is something I always have to like rein in on because I want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> there is a way to convert property that you buy with 1031 money, and your scenario is exactly what I talk about in every class I teach. Um, let's say you've been investing your, you know, your, your whole life. Right. And, but you've also been exchanging, right? So you've got, you know, 20 properties, 10 properties, whatever that you've been exchanging into over and over, over time. Right. Now those, those properties, it's not like the tax goes away. It's not eliminated. It's deferred. So, so those properties that you've been exchanging into, they, they have, generally speaking, very low tax basis. So at the point that you want to sell them, if you don't want to exchange anymore and just take the cash, you're going to have a pretty big tax spike if you do it all at once, especially. Mm-hmm. But 
in my dream scenario is I've got 10 properties that I'm going to sell. Let's say they're worth uh, 20 million each, right? And I want to go and buy a uh, like a lake house or a property in Malibu, right? And I, you know, I could probably get a 1,200 square foot property in Malibu <laughs> for that. And, um, and so what I'd do is I'd sell all these properties and exchange them into one exchange, then buy the dream house, right? That I really want to live in. But according to 1031, I can't. However, there is a revenue procedure that works with 1031. And it's Revenue Procedure 2008-16. Now I'm really letting my geek flag fly. Do it, um, Andrew, go. My favorite revenue procedure. <laughs> but you can use that to convert the property that you buy. And it's pretty simple. You buy the property, combining all the proceeds from all these, these, these properties you've been deferring forever. And then you, for 2008-16, I'm going to do an abbreviated version, but it's, for the two consecutive 12 month periods after you acquire the property, each 12 month period, you have to rent that property out a minimum of 14 calendar days, uh, charging fair market rent. Um, you can rent it as much as, as you like, but 14 is the minimum. You can't use it more than 14 days or 10% of the time you have it rented out at fair market rent. But after those two 12 month periods of elapse, and you reported that income on your federal tax returns and, and you let your CPA know that you're, li you're relying on this for uh, the conversion, uh, you could move into that house as your primary residence and the IRS can't make you pay the taxes that you deferred to buy it. Hmm. That's what I was asking. That's, so there that's, is a way. And that's then, interesting. <laughs> so yeah. like the opposite of deferring it's, your capital gains on uh, on the sale, you know, you got to live in it for two for the last five years, and now you got to not live in it for two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And here's where it gets weird. And everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to know that logical question is, well, how much? How do they know that I'm only using it for two days? I'm like, I'm not going to help you commit fraud. Just just go by the rules, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, okay, so let's say I do all of this, and then I move into the house, and it's awesome for a while, but then I want to move out of it. Well, if you if you turn it into your primary residence, you're only going to get up to $500,000 exclusion of your capital gain on that sale. And we know that that house is going to have a much higher tax liability than that. So the only other option would be to put it back into the rental pool now rent out the mansion again for two years um, and reclassify it as an investment property and then go buy more investment property. Hmm. And just keep playing the game. So Patrick, what, one of the things that comes to mind when I listen to, to all of this is, well, actually two things. One is that you need to start with a great professional like yourself to pre-plan, to know the rules, to understand how you're going to use this exchange, right? Before you even oh, yeah. consider doing it, like somebody should probably be consulting with somebody like you and, and kind of pre-plan it, know the steps and know what that roadmap looks like. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, part of the team, like having a good broker, real estate broker, a good CPA, mm -hmm. a good attorney, you know, and for specialized things like this, somebody like me that can help them with a 1031. Exchange. Now, really, all I do are 1031 exchanges, right? So, it's you know, it's it's a it's a funny niche, but you know, somebody who's knowledgeable about it. I've mean, got I've got customers that have been doing exchanges for generations, and hmm. they have, you know, they buy the craziest stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and we're talking about some of the wealthiest families in the country. Um, they'll buy. <laughs> Like there's these great big DST uh, type transactions where we're talking about hundreds of millions, if not billions, that they're investing in um, to defer taxes, and it's it's kind of a it's like a fractional interest with a debt component. So mm -hmm. it's just it's just amazing what some what some of these people are are able to do. And a lot of times, you know, I'm learning too, just like everybody else. I'm gonna talk to an attorney and we're going to figure out, you know, what's the best possible way for somebody to, to defer the tax liability. Um, and uh, yeah, there, it, it's, it helps to have 
you know, a, you know, like you know, I tell people all the time, a good broker or a good CPA. Exactly. I don't want to do my own taxes. I, you exactly. Know, um, I've been in real estate. I'm second generation real estate. I've worked in title insurance and in um, finance, and I've been doing this for the last ten years. And I've bought and sold real estate, but I've never bought and sold without real. I would not write my own real estate contract. Mm -hmm. And it's not because, I mean, maybe I could, but I don't want to, I want somebody on the hook mm -hmm. if something goes wrong. Right. Yeah. And that's what you're paying a realtor for. And that's why they're insured. Well, and that's. Yeah. yeah and, and I totally agree with you, Patrick. And that's, you know, let's imagine for a second that I'm an investor listen, listening to us all right now. Um, I now know that this is a great product and I see the value um, and, you know, I likely want to do it. But I know I need to have the good agents in our corner, you know, in my corner, and I got that. But for someone who deals with this tedious process, it's very timeline based. What are the steps you would tell me? Like, who's my first call? And then at, at what point do I need to call the next person? How or do I need get to get started? all four of them in a Zoom call to even start this process? How would how would that go? Or how would you suggest well, it go? You know, the first time person that's maybe selling a ranch or a farm or they're selling rent houses or um, you're selling your convenience store, you know, the first thing I would want if I were trying to plan it out would be a CPA that's knowledgeable about real estate. Now that's a rarity and, and, and predominantly um, the realtor, I mean, the CPAs that I work with aren't going to be aware or interested in 1031 exchange the average cpa is really almost just like a tax preparer now if you can find a good cpa that's looking for things that are going to benefit you especially in the real estate industry find a find a cpa that's knowledgeable about real estate and buying and investing and selling and living in that world because um you know i can't tell you at first i was shocked that that most CPAs didn't seem to know or care <laughs> about 1031. Um, but as I, as I had more experience with it, I realized, well, that's not what they do. In some cases, a CPA could go an entire career without ever having heard of a 1031 exchange. Hmm. Um, so to find a professional hmm. is good, but hmm. to find the one that's right for what you're doing is better. Um, I'd start with a CPA. CPA because first of all, they're you know their fees are regulated that you're not going to get gouged um, by a CPA. Um, the next would be the attorney. Now the attorney is great if if you're if you reached a certain level and you can afford to keep one on retainer, great. But an attorney that you can reach out to that's reasonable and from a transactional standpoint would be good. Also, you want to see somebody that's in real estate and tax. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I, I refer people out to attorneys um, and it's usually over like a partnership split or something that can create some added steps to a 1031 in order for them to be affected. Um, so um, a, a good real estate attorney that's, that's also tax oriented is, is, a, is kind of a must. Um, so I'd say, in that case, it's, it's CPA, attorney, and then the broker. Now, the broker, I'm not putting them last because I don't think they're as important, but I think that the broker is going to be, you're going to choose your broker based on what you're looking to buy uh, and where you're looking to buy. Um, one, uh, you know, one broker is not going to be perfect for everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you guys know, people specialize in, in different market segments multifamily, retail, yeah. office, yeah. industrial, um, farm and ranch, uh, yeah. residential. Um, and they're also regional. So you're going to want to find the person in the area where you're looking. Uh, with 1031, that can also be kind of a, a problem if, you, if you're too specific on the area you're looking to buy in, mm. because a lot of times a lot of other people are too, and it's hard to compete. And you need to have a broker that understands the timelines we talked about, right? So someone that can help you in planning, 
right? The purchase, they may not be involved in the sale, but they could maybe coordinate with the broker that is involved in the sale and 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 have an understanding of our timelines, the rules that you're, you're working with. And sometimes I find, for my clients at least, that are looking to exchange like properties, right? It's another SFR for an SFR maybe, or, or using the three house rule or, or um, three property rule, that it, it's helpful to, to know somebody like me, and I'm not the only one, this isn't just self-promotion, but somebody like me who has a book of business that where they have a lot of off-market deals that they can, because in this market, Patrick, like you had mentioned, it's it's harder to to get through that first 45 days and really lock down a property, get something under contract. So if I've got some off-market deals that I can present to to an investor, right? If you've got a, 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 a flow of that happening at all times, then sometimes that's your guy, right? Sometimes that's Absolutely. the best person. In yeah. Life. Yeah. It's especially the off market people, yeah. you know, like I said, if you're able to you know, cultivate that kind of a business, man, it's really it's to the benefit of your client, especially in 1031, because those deadlines are no joke. Uh, they don't, they don't, they don't change them except for uh, a federally declared disaster. That's the only reason <laughs> why you might be able to get an extension on the deadline. And, uh, <laughs> That's if you, if, last winter when we had that winter storm, I was in heaven because there had been so many people because of COVID that weren't either going out looking at properties, but the COVID deal was nothing. They gave us no extension, I mean, practically, you know, because of that one disaster declaration. So, Patrick, I, I just kind of want to I'm going to let Kyle close us out a little bit here because we're coming up on an hour and I don't want to bore everybody too much with this. But, Patrick, I really want to thank you for coming on and spending some time with us and with our audience. We reuse these things constantly. We send them out and it's really educational to have an understanding of what is a 1031 exchange? Is it right for me? Why do I use it? And sometimes people that are wired like me, they just, you start swimming in the details and sometimes you end up putting it off, right? And you don't do these things that you need to do because you get overwhelmed with all the details that you don't want to know or that you don't want to spend the time to learn. Um, and again, that's why we have people in our lives like our CPAs, like our attorneys, like people like you, Patrick. Patrick, how do people get a hold of you if they want more information about 1031 exchanges <laughs> uh, my number is 972-310-4127 um, my email is patrick.noonan and that's n-o-o-n-a-n at i is an igloo p is in paul x as an x-ray 1031.com um, that's my corporate email um, you can always send a send an email with an inquiry and uh, I'll send you more information than you'll probably want. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you framed that last bit with, um, you know, you know, a lot of folks, you know, don't, first of all, don't need, don't, don't know if they need an exchange. And I am not shoehorning people into doing an exchange. Typically my first call, I'm going to ask a series of questions that are going to determine whether or not you're really going to want to do this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in about 30 minutes of discussing uh, the, the situation that everyone, that each individual is in, I can usually help them decide whether or not they're going to want to do a 1031 exchange because there's a lot to it. There's a lot of rules and there's work that has to be done. And you want to make sure that there's enough benefit for you to go through that. I love it. Good information, Patrick. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, Patrick. Thank you for letting me play devil's advocate with you as well. So, it's hey, Patrick, time, guys. <laughs> what's that? What's that website? Is that the ipx1031.com? Yeah, it's a, uh, so ipx is the company that I work for. We're the largest qualified intermediary in the country. Our parent company is FNTG or Fidelity National Title Group. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So it's a multi-billion-dollar company. And, and one of the reasons why we're able to do some of the larger exchanges um, is because we carry the highest insurances in our industry. Hmm. So we carry a $100 million fidelity bond, hmm. a $50 million performance guarantee, and a $30 million Arizona emissions policy per file. Um, so 
Um, not that we really ever have to use them, but they're there for, for people's comfort. And um, additionally, the safety of, of proceeds is a big concern of ours. We, everybody has a segregated account. There's no commingling of funds or risky investments. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very, very safe. Uh, that's that's a, of our primary concern because there have been companies as big as ours in the past that have been wiped out because they made bad decisions, basically. They, uh, you know, they've invested exchangers proceeds in, and uh, subprime student back loans. <laughs> believe that. And so That's crazy. In 2007, wow. a giant company went down because of that, right? And then there's bad actors out there too, so you got to hmm. be careful. There's a there's an American Greed special on a guy that just hmm. took really, really? <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've been around the longest. We're you know. We're, you know, personally, I'm stodgy and conservative, and I'm going to try and scare scare people as much as I can, so that um, they're doing things well within the rules and, and not trying to create. And you know, a lot of times people try to recreate the wheel and think that they're going to be able to figure out a way to trick the IRS. But there's a lot of people out there that are trying to do that. Great, and the IRS great. is pretty good at creating a rule to stop a good idea. Um, you know, if you figure out a way to make money or stop paying taxes, they're going to create a rule to make you pay those taxes so um, so yeah but i like what i do and, and and pretty much like any any realtor i'm available if i'm awake so you can call me on myself after hours or weekends whenever you have to and, and i'd be happy to walk you through uh, any of your questions i love it patrick we're proud to have you as a referral partner and i want to thank you one more time for coming on yeah we do appreciate it I and mean, clearly you're knowledgeable about the subject so anybody if uh, you got any more questions give him a call um and if you any, want to get to him or got any questions for us give us a call 817-818-9039 shoot us an email show, show me the money, money at wertpm.com and thank you guys for tuning in all right thanks guys <laughs>